Hi kindergarten friends, we're here again with Stuart Little and today we're reading chapter 12, The Schoolroom. While Dr. Carey was making repairs on the car, Stuart went shopping. He decided since he was about to take a long motor trip, he should have the proper clothes. He went to a doll's shop where they had things that were the right size for him and outfitted himself completely with new luggage, suits, shirts, and accessories. He charged everything and was well pleased with his purchases. That night, he slept at the doctor's apartment. So there's a picture of him trying on clothes. The next morning, Stuart started early to avoid traffic. He thought it would be a good idea to get off the road Oh, to get out on the road before there were too many cars and trucks. He drove through Central Park, 112th Street, and then over to West Side Highway, then north to Sawmill River Parkway. The car ran beautifully, and although people were inclined to stare at him, Stewart didn't mind. He was very careful not to press the button which had caused so much trouble the day before. He made up his mind that he would never use that button again. Just as the sun was coming up, Stuart saw a man seated in thought by the side of the road. Stuart steered his car alongside, stopped, and put his head out. You're worried about something, aren't you? asked Stuart. Yes, I am, said the man, who was tall and mild. Can I help you with anything? asked Stuart in a friendly voice. The man shook his head. It's an impossible situation, I guess, he replied. You see, I'm the superintendent of schools in this town. That's not an impossible situation, said Stuart. It's bad, but it's not impossible. Well, continued the man, I've always got problems that can't, I can't solve. Today, for instance, one of my teachers is sick. Miss Gunderson, her name is. She teaches number seven school. I got to find a substitute for her, a teacher who will take her place. What's the matter with her? asked Stuart. I don't know exactly. The doctors say she may have rhinestones, replied superintendent. Can't you find another teacher? asked Stuart. No, that's the trouble. There's nobody in this town who knows anything. No spare teachers, no anything. School is supposed to begin in an hour. So here's a superintendent looking very stressed out and sad. I will be glad to take Mrs. Gunderson's place for a day if you would like, suggested Stuart agreeably. The superintendent of schools looked up. Really? Certainly, said Stuart. Glad to. He opened the door of the little car and stepped out. Walking around the rear, he opened the baggage compartment and took out his suitcases. If I'm to conduct a class in a schoolroom, I'd better take off these motor togs and get into something more suitable, he said. Stuart climbed to the back went into the bushes and was back in a few minutes wearing a pepper and salt jacket, an old striped trousers, a windows tie, and spectacles. He folded his other clothes and packed them away in the suitcase. Do you think you can maintain discipline? asked the superintendent. Of course I can, replied Stuart. I'll make the work interesting and the discipline will take care of itself. Don't worry about me. The man thanked him and they shook hands. At a quarter before nine, the Scholars had gathered in school number in school number seven. When they missed Mrs. Gunderson, and a word got around that there would be a substitute, they were delighted. A substitute, somebody whispered to someone else. A substitute, a substitute. The news traveled fast, and soon everyone in the schoolroom knew that they were all have a rest from Miss Gunderson for at least a day, and were going to have a wonderful experience being taught by a stranger whom nobody had ever seen before. Stuart arrived at nine. He parked his car briskly at the door of the school, stalked boldly into the room, found a yardstick leaning against Miss Gunderson's desk and climbed hand over hand to the top. There he found an inkwell, a pointer, some pins and pencils, a bottle of ink, some chalk, a bell, two hairpins, three or four books in a pile. Stuart scrambled nimbly to the top of the sack, stack of books and jumped for the button on the bell. His weight was enough to make it ring. Stuart promptly slid down, walked to the front of the desk, and said, Let me have your attention, please. Ooh, what do you think's about to happen? So, all these kids in a class, 
their teacher's sick, right? And as you know, like sometimes I've been sick. When you're sick, you have a substitute teacher. But their substitute teacher is Stuart Little, a mouse. So what do you think is going to happen? If you want, you can pause the video and go tell someone what you think is going to happen when the mouse is their teacher. Okay, let's find out. The boys and girls crowded around the desk to look at the substitute. Everyone talked at once. They seemed to be very much pleased. The girls giggled and the boys laughed and everyone's eyes lit up with excitement to see such a small and good looking teacher so appropriately dressed. Let me have your attention, please, repeated Stuart. As you know, Miss Gunderson is sick and I am taking her place. What's the matter with her? asked Roy Hart eagerly. Vitamin trouble, replied Stuart. She took vitamin D when she needed A. She took B when she was short of C and her system became overloaded with riboflavin, thiamine, hydrochloride, chloride, and even with pridoxin, the need for which a human nutrition has not been established. Let it be a lesson for us all. He glared fiercely at the children, and they made no more inquiries about Mrs. Gunderson. Everyone will now take his or her seat, commanded Stuart. The pupils filed obediently down the aisles and dropped into their seats, and in a moment there was silence in the classroom. Stuart cleared his throat, ahem, <clears throat> seizing a coat label with a eat in either hand to make himself look like a professor. Stuart began, Anybody absent? The scholars shook their head. Anybody late? They shook their heads. Very well, said Stuart. What's the first subject you usually take up in the morning? Arithmetic, shouted the children. Bother arithmetic, snapped Stuart. Let's skip it. There were wild shouts of enthusiasm at this suggestion. Everyone in class seemed perfectly willing to skip arithmetic for one morning. What next do you study? asked Stuart. Spelling, cried the children. Well, said Stuart, a misspelled word is an abomination in the eyesight, in the sight of everyone. I will consider it a fine thing to spell words correctly, and I strongly urge every one of you to buy a Webster dictionary and consult it whenever you are in the slightest doubt. For so much for spelling, what's next? The scholars were just as pleased to be let out of spelling as they were about arithmetic and they shouted for joy, and everybody looked at everybody else and laughed and waved handkerchiefs and rulers, and some of the boys threw spitballs at some of the girls. Stuart had to climb to a pile of books again and dive for the bell to restore order. What's next? he re repeated. Writing, cried the scholars. Goodness, said Stuart in disgust. Don't you children know how to write yet? Certainly we do, yelled one and all. So much for that, then, said Stuart. Social studies comes next, cried Elizabeth Gardner excited, eagerly. Social studies? Never heard of them, said Stuart. Instead of taking up any special subject this morning, why, why wouldn't it be a good idea if we just talked about something? The scholars glanced around each other. Could we talk about the way it feels to hold a snake in your hand and then it winds itself around your wrist, asked Arthur Greenlaw. We could, but I'd rather not, replied Stuart. Could we talk about sin and vice, pleaded Lydia Lacey. Nope, said Stuart, try again. Could we talk about the fat woman at the circus and she had her hair all over her chin, begged Isidore Freinberg. No, said Stuart, I'll tell you, let's talk about the king of the world. He looked all around the room, hopefully, to see how the children liked that idea. There isn't any king of the world, said Harry Jameson in disgust. What's the diff, said Stuart. There ought to be one. Kings are old fashioned, said Harry. Well, all right then, let's talk about the chairman of the world. The world gets into a lot of trouble because it has no chairman. I would like to be the chairman of the world myself. You're too small, said Mary Benedict. Oh, fish feathers, said Stuart. Size has nothing to do with it. It's temperament and the ability that counts. The chairman has to have ability and he must know what's important. How many of you know what's important? Up went all the hands. Very good, said Stuart, calling one leg across the other, shoving his hands in his pockets of his jacket. Harry, you tell us what's important. A shaft of sunlight at the end of the dark afternoon, 
a note of music and the way the back of a baby's neck smells if its mother keeps it tidy, answered Henry. Correct, said Stuart. Those are the important things. You forgot one thing though, Mary. Benedict's, what did Harry forget? He forgot ice cream with chocolate sauce on it, said Mary quickly. Exactly, said Stuart. Ice cream is important. Well, now, if I'm going to be chairman of the world this morning, we've got to have some rules. Otherwise, it will be too confusing with everyone running every which way, helping himself to things and nobody behaving. We've got to have some laws if we're going to play this game. Can anybody suggest any good laws for the world? Albert raised his hand. Don't eat mushrooms. They might be toadstools, replied Albert. That's not a law, said Stuart. That's merely a bit of friendly advice. Very good advice, Albert, but advice and law are not the same. Law is much more solemn than advice. Law is extremely solemn. Anybody else think of a law for the world? Nick's on sweeping any, swiping anything, suggested John solemnly. Very good, said Stuart. Good law. Never poison anything but rats, said Anthony. That's no good, said Stuart. It's unfair to rats. A law has to be fair to everyone. Anthony looked sulky. But rats are unfair to us, he said. Rats are objectionable. I know they are, said Stuart. But from a rat's point of view, poison is not objectionable. A chairman has to see all sides of to a problem. Have you got a rat's point of view? Asked Anthony. You look like a little rat. No, said Stuart. I have more of the point of view of a mouse, which is very different. I see things whole. It's obvious to me that rats are underprivileged. They've never been able to get out into the open. Rats don't like the open, said Agnes. That's because whenever they come out, somebody socks them. Rats might like it in the open if they were allowed to use it. Any other ideas for laws? Agnes raised her hand. There ought to be a law against fighting. Impractical, said Stuart. Men like to fight. But you're getting warm, Agnes. No scrapping? asked Agnes timidly. Stuart shook his head. Absolutely no being mean, suggested Mildred. Very fine law, said Stuart. When I am chairman, anybody who is mean to anybody else is going to catch it. That won't work, remarked Herbert. Some people are just naturally mean. Albert is always mean to me. I'm not saying it'll work, said Stuart. It's a good law and we'll give it a try. We'll give it a try right here and now. Somebody do something mean to somebody. Harry, you be mean to Catherine. Wait a minute now. What, what is that you've got in your hand, Catherine? It's a tiny little pillow stuffed with sweet balsam. Does it say for you a pine, for you a balsam on it? Yes, said Catherine. Do you love it very much, asked Stuart. Yes, I do, said Catherine. Okay, Harry, grab it, take it away. Harry ran over to where Catherine sat, grabbed the little pillow from her hand and ran back to her seat while Catherine screamed. Now then, said Stuart in a fierce voice, hold on, my good people, while your chairman consults the book of rules. He pretended to thumb through a book. Here we are, page 492, absolutely no being mean. Page 560, Nick's on swiping anything. Harry Jameson had broken two laws. The law was being mean and the law about swiping. Let's get Harry and set him back before he comes so mean, people become so mean, he will, people will hardly recognize anymore. Come on. Stuart ran for the yardstick and slid down like a fireman coming down a pole in a firehouse. He ran towards Harry and the other children jumped up from their seats and raced down up and down the aisles and crowded around Harry while Stuart demanded that he give back the little pillow. Harry looked frightened, although he knew it was just a test. He gave Catherine the pillow. So there's Stuart sliding down the yardstick. There, it worked pretty well, said Stuart. No being mean is a perfectly good law. He wiped his face with his handkerchief. For he was quite warm from the exertion of being chairman of the world. It had taken more running and leaping and sliding than he'd ever imagined. Catherine was very much pleased to have her pillow back. Let's see that little pillow a minute, said Stuart, whose curiosity was beginning to get the better of him. Catherine showed it to him. It was about as long as Stuart was high, and Stuart suddenly thought what a fine, sweet-smelling bed it would make for him. He began to want the pillow himself. There's a picture of Stuart yelling at this kid to give the pillow back. 
It's a very pretty thing, said Stuart, trying to hide his eagerness. You don't want to sell it, do you? Oh, no, replied Catherine. It was a present to me. I suppose it was given to you by a boy you met at Lake Hopatcog last summer. It reminds you of him, murmured Stuart dreamily. Yes, it was, said Catherine, blushing. Ah, said Stuart. Summers are wonderful, aren't they, Catherine? Yes, and last summer was the most wonderful summer I've had in all my life. I can't imagine, replied Stuart. You sure wouldn't want to sell that little fellow? Catherine shook her head. Don't know as I blame you, replied Stuart quietly. Summertime is important. It's like a shaft of sunlight. Or a note in music, said Elizabeth. Or the way the back of a baby's neck smells as his mother keeps it tidy, said Marilyn. Stuart sighed. Never forget your summer times, my dears, he said. Well, I've got to be along. It's a pleasure knowing you all. Class is dismissed. Stuart strode rapidly to the door, climbed into the car, and with its final wave of a hand, drove off to the northerly direction, while the children raced alongside and screamed, Goodbye! 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 They all wished they could have a substitute every day instead of Miss Gunderson. And here is a picture of him racing off in his little car. And they had a mouse for a substitute. The end. So I was thinking about something you could write during this. And I was thinking, what if you had a substitute teacher that was a mouse? And I was thinking that'd be a really cool book to write. So if you're looking for something to write about, you could write about one day if you had a substitute for a mouse. It could start like this. One day, Miss Sanborn was gone from class and we had a substitute. When he walked into the door, he was only one inch tall. He was just a mouse. And then you could keep writing the story and to see what happens next. If you write that, feel free to send it to me because I would love to read it. Bye.